Jack Diesel. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. How are you, sir? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. I was just uh, singing your praises for the last five minutes. I don't know if you've heard well, any I of that. I appreciate that. Sorry I'm late. Uh, a woodpecker uh, got into one of my tree houses, and I was, I was trying to catch him. Did you catch him? No, I didn't. I was just playing. That was a joke. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, it was very believable, to be honest. You live a very interesting life. Uh, and speaking was. of which, yes. uh, you, ha you have this new show that's out on TNT every Thursday night. It's called Shack Life. It premiered last week uh, to, to a ton of praise. And uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. And especially now in this in this crazy time, it's great to have new content and fun things to get our mind off of things. But why I'm here, I'm the MMA guy at ESPN, and the episode that's airing tomorrow night is very uh, MMA heavy. There's a lot of famous MMA fighters. So first, can you tell us about the show, the concept of the show, what it's all about? Well, MMA is the is the reason I became a, a, a champion. Uh, you, you know, I always used to practice basketball. It wasn't enough. Because when I played basketball, it wasn't a basketball. It was more wrestling. So when I trained MMA with uh, John Burke, a friend of mine down in uh, Orlando, I came back in the best shape of my life. That was in 2001, dominated. So I'm a creature of habit. Did it again, won the second championship. Did it again, won the third championship. Got cute, got away from it, lost, got traded to Miami, did it again, won the fourth championship. So, you know, MMA is, is, is something that always kept my heart rate up. It was something I was very interested in. I'm a physical guy. I like physicality. Uh, you know, you talk about athletes. MMA athletes are probably the best athletes on on the planet. You know, the, the uh, training that they go through, you know, the physical stuff that they go through. I've been to almost all of the top UFC fights. Those guys are specimen. And I'm a sport. I wish I could hit some of those, some of those NBA players I used to play against just like that. So uh, I've definitely been a fan of MMA. I was I was introduced to MMA by Vitor Belfort. Hmm. We were at a, we were at a camp in uh, Hawaii, and Vitor just com comes up behind me and grabs me, and I'm like, "Hey, what are you doing?" He's like, "No, no, no, no. I'm a big fan of yours. I just wanted to show you what I do. I'm having a fight tonight." And Vitor bought it, fought this big dude in a lumberjack suit, and he 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 put him down in five seconds. And ever since then, I became a fan. And then I met uh, 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 Dana White. And, you know, me and Dana White are friends. And, you know, I'm able to, you know, go to the training facility and, you know, watch all those specimens train. So uh, it's a great thing for me. And I, and I love MMA. So I said to myself, let me try it. Let me train. I wanted to fight a couple of pro guys, but they were uh, uh, having matches. So they put me against a guy uh, my size who was an amateur. He wasn't pro. And I'll... Uh, I'll let you watch the episode to uh, see what happened. But listen, uh, I did call out Hong Man Choi a long time ago because I've never fought anyone my size. Ever since 10 years old, I've, I've heard the phrase, pick on somebody else's side, pick on somebody else's side. So at the time, a couple years ago, if he was willing to fight, I would have fought him, Hong Man Choi. How serious did those talks get? How, like, how far, did you ever actually seriously pursue it? No, I just mentioned it. I wanted somebody to come back. Well, actually, I wanted Dana to come back and say, I'll set it up. But nobody ever did. So, uh, you know, it, it just turned into, you know, I say something, he say something, I say something, he say something. But I definitely would have, you know, gave it a try. Yeah. Um, so in this episode, you actually, like I said, you get your hands dirty, you grapple uh, an actual UFC fighter. I don't know if I want to give away the name. Should I give away who the fighter is or should we not say who the fighter is? We won't say what happens, but should we say who the fighter is? Because people know who this man is. Yeah, go ahead. Tell him. Greg Hardy. You go up against yes. Greg Hardy, the former NFL uh, Greg, defensive Greg, player of the year. Greg Hardy is the strongest guy I've ever wrestled in my life. Really? Oh, nice kid. Strong. Taught me a lot. And if we got into it, it'll probably be a, a long day for me. He's <laughs> physical. He likes to fight just like me. He likes to bang. And he was, it was actually, you know, he actually taught me a lot because, you know, when I go to my little grappling school in Orlando, it's really nobody my size. So to, to, to you know, go, go up against somebody with that strength and that, it was tough for me. 
I'm not going to give away what happened, but it's very clear watching that you know what you're doing. And like you said, you've been a big fan of this for a long time. I'm curious, though, when you were, you know, playing in the NBA, when you were in your prime, didn't the teams not want you to train in MMA? Like I've talked to, like I talked to Chris Stapps Porzingis. He's a big fan as well. And he's like, oh, the teams don't want me to train because they have so much invested in you. So how'd you get around that? I had, <clears throat> I had a couple clauses in my contract. I was allowed to drive a motorcycle. The uh, only thing I couldn't do was scuba dive and skydive. Everything else I could do. <clears throat> you know, wow. I could go to concerts and rave. I can do boxing matches. I can play another chair like I've never had that. So, but I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't scuba dive or, or skydive. And then, listen, it's, it's training. You know, they just wanted me to, you know, you know, come back and, you know, some type of playing shape. Everyone knows I didn't come back in basketball shape because that's not, because I, I always said to myself, who do I need to get ready for? I get ready when I get ready. But, you know, I always used to train, train with my hands, you know, MMA training, all, 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 all that stuff. Uh, recently, Israel Adesanya, the uh, the middleweight champion of the UFC, he showed a DM that you sent him saying that you you said to him that he's your favorite fighter. And I just want to confirm, Izzy's a, a, is a truth speaker, but did you in fact send this DM or was this Photoshop? No, I actually did send him to him, but I have a lot of favorite fighters. Uh, he's one of my favorite fighters. Uh, Francis, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't want to mispronounce his last name. Can you say and Francis? Ganu. Yeah, Francis and Ganu is my favorite fighter. Yo Romero, who's a friend of mine, is my favorite fighter. Uh, you know, and and I used to like all the old school fighters too. I used to love Cabbage. Remember Cabbage? Cabbage Correa. But Cabbage, Tank Abbott, man, I used to love all those guys. So, but yes, I did send him him that that because he's a joy to watch, and you know he's done a lot for the sport. And the good thing about MMA is every three or four years you get a person that just comes out of nowhere and just you know takes over the sport. Conor McGregor is, you know, one of my favorites. So uh, I just enjoy watching these uh, phenomenal athletes perform. And so the premise of the show is uh, you want to show us about your life, but you also have aspirations. Like, do you want to be, I'm not so from. I, I remember the Shaq food days, like you and the Fushnikins and your rap albums, but are you, you're into like DJing now, right? So you're trying yes. to get into shape for that. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, the premise of the show is how do, how do you do so much? And I said, well, it's simple. And it's like, it can't be simple. You do too much. I said, well, I'm showing you. So I'm just showing everybody my life and, you know, how I do it. But, look, I've been DJing since 88. I've been, I've been doing shows 10,000, 30,000, 100,000. Because, you know, the concept is always the same. If people are going to pay money to watch you perform, you put on a show. And the reason why I DJ now is I miss the show. I miss coming in and 7-1. And, you know, I, I just miss that. So, you know, when I'm going out here with these kids, and I know what they want because I have children. So I have, like, you know, uh, internal research at the house. I know what's hot. I know what's not hot. I know what to play. I know what not to play. So when I go out there and those kids pay their hard-earned money to see the shack, I got to give them a show. As I mentioned, people are starving for positive content, things to get their mind off things. What do you do? I mean, because your life is so busy, right? You do so much, not just the TV work, as you mentioned, you have so many businesses. Do you have moments during this past month where everything's shut down, where you're starting to feel down? And if so, how do you get out of that? I'm sure a lot of people would look to you for advice. Well, my thing is I try to take in it two minutes out of the day to inspire people. So me and my kids, we've been having kitchen concerts. We do TikTok dances. Whatever I can do to just make people smile. It's tough for a lot of million people. 17 million people file for unemployment. You know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of people have has, you know, lost family members. Uh, my condolences goes out to Carl Anthony Towns. His mom, you know, just passed away the other day. So this is real life for a lot of people. I just try to make people laugh. I don't, I don't sit in my house and say I'm down, I'm down because I'm not really down. Uh, you know, I just, you know, we just have to follow the rules, continue with the social distancing. But I just, you know, just try to make people laugh. You know, like if I could say something or do something, just have you pick up your phone and laugh for a couple of seconds, restart your thinking, restart your battery. I'm happy to do that. But I don't sit in my house and go, oh, woe is me. No, I can't do that. How do you feel about the NBA coming back? Do you feel like this is something that needs to happen or would you rather them err on the side of caution? I would rather everybody be cautious. And, you know, Adam Silver, uh, he's done a great job. He was he, he was at the forefront of it saying, you know what, safety of the players, I'm going to cancel this thing. 
you know, I just wish that uh, we would get a definitive date. I'm hearing 14 days, April 10th, April 30th, May 30th. So, but I, I would, I would love everyone to be safe. I just wanted to get back to normal, but I'm a guy that follows rules and regulations. So, you know, I'm just sitting back like every other American, just, you know, waiting and saying, but, you know, hopefully there's, there's a couple young, brilliant doctors and scientists that's, you know, getting, getting a hold of this thing and we can make it uh, uh, start to, you know, get the uh, numbers down a little bit. Uh, there's been some talk of like holding all the games in one location, Bahamas, Las Vegas has been brought up. Uh, have you heard any of this? And if so, do you think that's a feasible idea, like to play all the games in one spot? I've heard it, but I haven't heard it from the powers to be. So, you know, crazy thing about the world we live in now is so many information sources. You don't know, you know, who's saying what or, you know, what information is true, what information is not true. So we uh, we we'll just have to sit back. Um, one of the guys that you link up with in the show that airs tomorrow, in the episode that airs tomorrow, is Jorge Masvidal, who scored uh, the fastest uh, knockout in UFC history. And he shows also, you the knee. Also one of my favorite fighters. Jorge, I forgot to mention you. I apologize. <laughs> I like him because he, like, to me, there's two different type of fighters, right? There's the fighters that come in in perfect shape. No body fat, boom, boom, boom. And then there's the ones that just like to fight like me. That's what Horace Jorge is. Like when I saw him, I knew he was a fighter, but I didn't know he was as bad as he was. Like he showed me a couple moves and I was like, okay. But then when he got in the ring, that, that actually was my first time seeing a fight. But then when he got in the ring, I was like, wow, this guy's real. Like I, I can tell who's real and who's not real. So he, he's definitely one of my favorites. And you know, what he did to my guy, <laughs> He's, oh Diaz brothers, oh Nick, you know I love, I love you know I love the Diaz brothers ever since they they first came out. But uh, he can fight. Miami is in the house, and he's gonna be around for a while. He definitely. Um, the the thing about you is you have a heart of gold, and as you mentioned, you try to brighten people's uh, days. I wanted to ask you about two kind of famous MMA stories that I found out about you that maybe a lot of people don't know. Um, you were at the UFC event in Anaheim last August. Um, Nate fought Anthony Pettis on that card. Daniel Cormier, uh, another Louisiana guy, fought on that card and he lost. Do you remember running into him backstage after he lost? He was very emotional. His wife was emotional and uh, you shared some words of wisdom with him. Do you remember this at all? Yeah, I do. I, do you remember what you said went, to him? I went to him because I know he was... Uh, I just, look, I, I just hugged him and said, great job. Sometimes you win them, sometimes you lose them but you're still the champ to me. No, no, no. It's only one guy that's undefeated now. Everybody else has, has taken a loss. The only guy that's undefeated in, in, in the sport and been been up, uh, you know, started, he's still undefeated, Floyd Mayweather. Everybody else has won, been up, lost, got it back. So I just told him, I said, champ, Hang in there. And, you know, he actually fought fought a good fight. And he's also one of my uh, favorite fighters. So, you know, I just wanted to let him know, like, hey, man, I'm proud of you. And, again, Now you're going to have a fighter in your hand. And, you know, he didn't put the kid away earlier, and the kid just, the, you know, the kid just won. But it was a hell of a, a main event. So I just went in the back and said, hey, man, I love you. Great job. Get him next time. I'll see you soon. And, and my other favorite Shaq UFC moment is when you were next to Max Holloway's son when he lost in Atlanta last uh almost exactly a year ago and his son was crying Do you remember that his dad was in there that's yeah. got to be traumatic for a kid to see his dad getting beat up and you were there telling him to feel better that was amazing to watch yeah it was there and you know i have i have children of my own and my kids used to be like that when i lose or when i miss a couple of free throws and people talk about their daddies so i just grabbed his son and said hey i'm uncle shack your daddy gonna be all right don't worry about it when all this is over you make sure you give your daddy a hug and tell him you love him so I was just trying to, you know, be a great uncle at the time.
And can I ask you, are you familiar with John Jones and the troubles that he has had? He's considered the best in our sport, but sometimes he can't seem to stay out of trouble. No one was more famous than you back in your day. And you did a very good job. You know, you lived in a different time, of course, no social media. So there weren't, you know, as many people watching you. But how did you, you know, avoid all that sort of stuff and avoid trying to, you know, get yourself in the wrong well, position? Well, I love John Jones. And if he ever needs to talk to me, he can call me. I don't want to speak on John Jones as if I'm holier than thou. I've never been that type of person. I love John. I don't want to talk about his discretions online like this without him being here. But John needs to know and understand that if he needs anything from me, he can call me, he can text me. And I wish him the best. I wish his family the best. And he's also one of my uh, you know, favorite fighters. But again, I'm not going to sit here and say, John should do this, John should do that. We have too many people doing that now. You know, kicking people where they when when they're down, I'm never going to do that. So, John, if you're watching this, I know you probably are. You know how to contact me if you want to talk to me about anything. I'm always there for you, brother. Much respect. Uh, can I also yeah. ask you? Um, a lot of people are excited about the Chicago Bulls documentary that's coming out starting on uh, on Sunday. Um, do you remember that season? The 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 ninety seven ninety eight Bulls. Uh, you were playing with the Lakers. You played them twice. Uh, one game you were out, the second game you played. Do you remember playing that particular Bulls team? Of course I do. We either won or we lost. Yes. And I, know they were, I know they were hard to beat. You know, I, I finally revealed that when I first got in the league, I was terrified of Jordan. Because the reason why I was terrified, because as a kid, it's like you're watching a God. Now you're on the same court with God. And all the stuff that he was doing when I was a kid is true. He can fly. He can bump you in the air, still be in the air when you come down, lay it up. He's, he's in perfect condition. His jump shot is crazy. If he steals a ball on the break, all the fans are going to stand up and he's going to dunk it. So everything I was seeing when I was a kid was really true. A lot of guys, I was like, oh, you're not – I saw you on TV, but now that I'm here, you're not really that good. But with him, everything you saw as a kid was true. But, you know, once I got over that, then I started to, you know, play, play – um, a little better, but that team of the one that went seventy-two and ten, I knew they was going to win the whole year. Yeah, but you guys actually beat them. You beat the last um, MJ Bulls team. You beat them by twenty-five. One of their worst losses of that season in February of that year, nineteen ninety-eight. And afterwards, you know I, I, why? why is that? That's why. You, <laughs> yeah. See that right there. <laughs> yes. Afterwards, MJ said, "Someone asked him, you think you'll see these guys in the finals?'" And he said, I don't know about them. We'll be there. I'm not sure if they'll make it. In the end, you guys didn't make it to the finals that year. But it actually got me thinking. I feel like the three-peat Lakers – This is. I'm not trying to make a hot take here. But the three-peat Lakers in your primes would have beaten those Bulls in their primes. Of course. The one yes, easily. Yeah. Why? Because I, I would have killed Luke Longley, Bill Winning, Cartwright. <laughs> yeah. So the factor is me and my free throw shoot. So – Okay, another question is, our Lakers in their prime and Chicago in their prime, who is Phil Jackson with? Is he with us or is uh, he with them? I think he's with them because he was with them first. Uh, so he would have tried the hacker shack thing. Which, so the I, I still would have averaged my 28-29, but the key would have been the free throws. So, you know, with me, it's always 50-50, so hopefully it would have been on. If I'd been on, we win. If I'd been off, we lose, but. You know, I love having these conversations. They would have did this, we would have did that. But I, I can strictly say I think we would have beat them. Well, the one common denominator from all those those six finals were they always play teams with weak centers, right? Luke right. Longley, Greg Ostertag, right? You know, like Duckworth, the Lakers, you know, Vladdy Divac was. They never played a dominant center. so that And, and Kobe would have been on. So so I actually I think that this is a very legitimate argument. I thought, I know people will say I'm crazy now, but I think you guys would have beat them. Even with Del Harris as coach. I, I agree. And I also want to say I'm, I've been a fan of yours for a while. You have great knowledge of sports. I, you know, I appreciate your hard work. I really do. Wow. Thank you. That means a lot. Uh, I, yeah. I thought you didn't know the, who I was, Shaq. Stop it. I know who you are. You just are. made why, my day. That's why, I, that's why I agreed to do this interview. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I won't keep you uh, any longer. Yeah. Let me ask you one last thing, Shaq. One okay. last thing. Yep. You, were, you were asked recently your favorite sports moment involving you. You said, of course, 2000 Western Conference Final, the, uh, the, the alley-oop, right? But as right. a fan, as a fan, not involving you, 
where you were just a fan rooting. Is there one that comes to mind? You talking about while I was playing or? or you, you could have been a youngster. Yeah, lifetime. I have a lot. Let me see. Let me, let me give you one. Give me some time. No I'm problem. Think you want. Think. What sport? Basketball or football? Whatever. A moment where you felt it in your heart. You were so happy. You were a kid. You were jumping up and down. The joys that only, you know, sports can bring you. It was a moment that made me want to become an NBA player. Because I was a medium level juvenile delinquent. I was more into football. I was more into hurting people. Right? Never basketball, I was okay. It was two moments. So when John Conkak signed the big contract, then I really started focusing on basketball. My father takes me to a game, Madison Square Garden. We're sitting up top. I know who Dr. J is. He's smooth. I, I like him because he's smooth, Afro. He goes baseline and throws it down. Crowd goes crazy. And that's when I look at my father and say, you know what? This is what I want to do when I get older. So, so shout out to Dr. J because when he went baseline, the crowd went crazy. It's just like all the basketball angels in my body right there. Like I just, I, I kind of got scared and I, was a, and I just felt something I never felt before. And I went home and I started practicing and, you know, I just, you know, really became good and just, you know, stuck with it. So that's probably my answer. So shout out to Julius Irving for uh, help creating the character known as Shaq. That's incredible. Shaq, thank you so much. Right. Congratulations on the new show. Shaq Life, All Thursday right. night, TNT. Much love, my man. Look, I'm going bald, America. You look great. You never look better. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.